Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, thank you for the privilege of gathering together in your presence. We ask, O oh Lord, that because you said you would be here when we gathered in your name, that you would help us and turn our hearts to you. Open our minds to you. Form in us that which you desire. Make room in us for that which you want to say. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. My wife and I got here yesterday afternoon and uh, had a great dinner with Rector and his wife, Senior Warden and his wife, at the Nancy Lopez Club. Uh, wonderful food and wine. Uh, came back, <coughs> in bed, got up early. I get up really early on a Sunday morning. And what I typically do, we always stay at the Hampton Inn, wherever we are. Uh, I am now a silver member. <laughs> just because of these accumulated visits. And uh, but what I do is that I take my laptop and the books I'm studying for the sermon and I go downstairs typically around 5.15 or so in the morning. Uh, usually there's nobody else there. But one of the things that's always true that I have to learn to shut out is that you walk into the lobby area and they're playing this time of year, of course, it's getting to look a lot like Christmas. <laughs> Bing Crosby, every kind of little holiday Christmas song you can imagine. At a fairly hefty level of volume, too. Almost a little bit too much when you haven't had your coffee. Um, but then you turn into the dining area, and so I walk in, and there's a big flat screen TV, and what's playing? CNN. So you're getting headlines and stories on CNN. Even from behind, you're hearing, come send a call, come send a call. <laughs> and then I sit down. And I sit down with the TV here and the lobby here. And the contrast between this very chirpy, upbeat music and what I'm seeing on CNN is pretty significant. All of the protests that were going on all over the country yesterday around the killings and what's happening, more response to the torture report from the CIA, a new case down in North Carolina where a young black youth had been shot by the police and there is now questions. No, no, no. His, uh, his, his death was rendered suicide and it's now being reopened by the federal government because perhaps that was not the case. And if you've been paying any attention to the news, the protests that started in New York uh, have spilled even down into Orlando. And uh, so that there are what are called die-ins, where a bunch of people come in and lay down on the ground to disrupt traffic and all sorts of things. So here I am listening to all of this on CNN and hearing all of these sort of innocuous Christmas songs. Not not what I would call true Christian hymns, because some of the Christmas carols actually could speak quite well to the things that are being mentioned on CNN, but not these selections. Again, think in Crosby. Um, and then, to sort of add fuel, in the very center of it, I opened the prayer book for the colic this morning, and the colic says, stir up your power, O Lord, and with great might come among us. And because we are sorely hindered by our sins, let your bountiful grace speedily help and deliver us. And that's where I could exhale. Because looking at that, do I have answers for all of that? No. In fact, that's a part of the dilemma. Most of us don't. We're dealing not just with issues of personal trespasses in these cases, but what's very, very clear is that we are dealing with systems that are broken, flawed, and therefore resulting in the mistreatment of individuals. Even Saturday, yesterday, at the demonstrations in Washington, 
One of the leaders of the march was the Washington Chief of Police, who acknowledged the systems are breaking. So there is that. And yet I listen to the chirpy little tunes, and at best what they are is escapism. Now, all of us need a little escapism every now and then. I, I'm not sort of being judgmental. Uh, but do those songs have substantive theological answers for the cries that are going on in CNN? The answer is, well, of course they don't, and they were never meant to. They were meant to just put us in a mood. It's beginning to look a lot like this. As opposed to actually answering the cries of either our culture or the cries of the human heart. And so we go to the collect, and we go to the collect because the colleague does, in fact, say things in the midst of the situation that I think are extraordinarily important, that set the ground for us to be able to look intelligently, as Christians, intelligently at the content of the scripture in the light of what we know and what we're experiencing. You see, I sincerely hope that while there will be times when you will want to come to church to escape what's going on out there, that's not wrong. But if that's your only mode, then I think you're missing something extraordinarily important. Because you see, Christians are meant to be that nexus, that connection point between all that is happening in the world, from the frivolous to the tragic, and the very presence of God. Because to say that you are a Christian means the kingdom of God is within you. The very same spirit which raised Jesus from the dead dwells within you. In other words, we're not trafficking in nice. We're trafficking in powerful, powerful movements of the spirit of God that have the potential to dramatically change people and cultures. We're not just sort of playing church. If you want to go play church, I don't know that this is the place for you to be. But if you want to be a part of something that can actually touch the course of eternity and affect people and situations in time and space, right now where we live, this is the place for you. Because what we're praying is, we're asking God to do the, the extraordinary. Stir up your power, O Lord, and with great might come among us. There is passion in that prayer. It, it's not the kind of prayer that says, well, Lord, I know you're really dealing with a lot of huge, big things today, but and, and my need might not seem particularly important, but if you might be able to please spare the time to help me with some, so I'd be really grateful. There's nothing wrong with that. But this is sort of like taking hold of the horns of prayer. Almost, it's, it, it reflects the cry of Jacob who says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And that's not presumption. That's faith. That's faith in action. And that's what this prayer is reflecting. Because you see, if I look honestly at what's going on on CNN, I need God to break through. I need him to change circumstances I need, to, I need him to supernaturally inspire the people who are involved in the decision making far beyond their capacity to be able to think. I need God to be able to change things in such a way that we finally begin to face the fact that our best ideas are not adequate to answer the question. And so God, we need you to show us some new things. Even if the people in charge don't believe a whit of this, the fact of the matter is one of the glories of God is that he knows how to work with leaders even if they're atheists. So it's not that somehow the people have to believe the same way that we do. Uh, if you think that's true, you won't pray for many people, will you? It does the church no good for them to have prayed more for Obama than they did for Bush or vice versa regardless of your political persuasion. Because we need God to break in and do things that both of them desperately need. And so that's what we're praying. Why do we have the gall or the courage 
to be able to pray like that. That's where the scripture comes in. And it's so important because it's what we see both in the Christian church as well as in Jesus. We see human beings who really do have something supernatural inside of them. The very same spirit which raised Jesus from the dead. I mean, great power is within them. And not only is it within them, but they know how to mediate that power in such a way that it actually makes a difference in the lives of other people. Or they know how to go into their prayer closet, close the door, and begin to beseech the, beseech the God of heaven and actually see circumstances change. You see, what we're not doing in the midst of this is, in a service like this, is trying to create an atmosphere where after it's all over, you feel better. But nothing much is different, except that you just feel a little better. You could go to a Disney movie and have that happen to you. It's much, much, much more sacred than that. And even though we often get it wrong, even though our best efforts don't look for us, because we're broken, fallible human beings, enough breakthroughs happen that we know that it is in fact worth the effort. Francis McNutt, who was a pioneer in Christian healing ministry in Jacksonville, says it this way. Do I, when I pray for people for healing, do they all get healed every time? Oh no, they don't. Do I wrestle with that? Of course I do. But the fact of the matter is, is that when I do pray, some do get healed. And I'd rather have the sum plus the disappointments than to give up and not pray for anyone. And I think that's how it is, you see. We take the steps, and there are occasions where we see God break through and do something. And then there are other times where we feel like we do the very same thing. And the heavens are quiet. God doesn't seem to answer. Or if his answer is, no. And then we wonder, you know, we're an ox. What are we going to do now? But I want to say to you, that's normal question. Because we can never control God by our prayers, ever. Because that makes us God. He's not an international, eternal vending machine. But instead, it's a relationship. And out of our conversation with the divine, things, in fact, do happen by his choosing as we ask and pray. In other words, our prayers really do matter. In fact, Jesus is blunt. You know, the reason why you don't get it is because you don't ask. Can't be more candid than that. And it is because we know that we are tied into the Lord of heaven and earth in a visceral, personal, intimate way that, and that the very same spirit which raised Jesus from the dead dwells within us. That eternity is in our chest to speak about as graphically as I can. That it's not just somehow that we have this sort of spiritual being kind of floating in and out of us all the time, like some kind of task with a friendly ghost. But instead, that deep in the deepest part of who we are is incarnate the Holy Spirit of God, the very same Spirit which raised Jesus from the dead, imparted to us in baptism and given to us inextricably, so that we can say to a baptized child or an adult, heir of the kingdom of God, you are received and marked as Christ's own, when? Forever. Not just so long as you're good. If that were true, we'd all be saved. Right? Not your head. <laughs> all of that is to say, that is why Paul the Thessalonian reading can say what feels like the most shockingly Pollyanna things to a group of people who are suffering significant persecution. First Thessalonians is the earliest New Testament writing that we have. Predates the Gospels, predates all the other letters. So that when you read the book of First Thessalonians, you're getting a snapshot of the earliest record of Christianity that we have. So it's vitally important. And therefore, these are a group of people who, in fact, are experiencing things like the confiscation of their property because they choose to follow Jesus 
or they're being stoned to death in some cases for blasphemy. This is not some people for whom the Christian life is a convenience that they need so that they can feel a little better about dying, but rather it is the center point of their lives around which everything else rotates. And it is to that group of people that Paul says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, there's not a lot of places in the Bible where the writer says, for well, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Which means when I see that phrase, I'm going to pay attention. I take it as a directive, in other words. It's not a place that's sort of up for discussion. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. If what I want to do is please God, that means, ooh, I need to pay attention to this. And so, in this moment, or this morning, where I'm hearing innocuous, chirpy movie music and death and destruction on the television set, can I in that moment rejoice, pray, and give thanks? That, you see, is the existential question of what these verses do or don't mean. In the midst of that, what can I give thanks for? How, what do I rejoice? I rejoice for the fact that in the midst of, because these are all things the scripture affirms, that in the midst of horror and tragedy, God is not absent. But instead, what he is doing is fueling grace and mercy to those who call upon him. Both those who are the objects of the sword of those who are being beheaded for the Christian faith, as well as those who are working to see systems change so that ISIS is in fact isolated, causing us as a body of Christ to think differently about the courage we should take in our own country in the face of the power of their courageous witness. We can't be bystanders if we are members of one body. We cannot. All of that is going on. And more importantly than even all of that, by their own testimony, by their own testimony, is that they know that the sword of the one who beheads them does not have the last word. But that when their body is destroyed, what's going to happen to the essential part of who they are? As the scripture says, Job, I know I will see, my, see God. I myself will see him, and my eyes will behold him who is my friend and not a stranger. We say it at every single funeral service. In other words, the horror of martyrdom is not the end, but rather God takes it and uses it so that it becomes an entryway into that place, as it says in Revelation, where there is no pain, where there is no grief, and where God wipes away every tear from every eye. And we get courage to be able to stand up and say, both to those who tolerate such persecution, as well as others to say, that is genocide. And cannot be consonant with any understanding of people of faith. That's our job. And believe me, it is our job to speak up. If you move to the villages to blend in and be quiet, I think God might have something else to say about that. But rather, it may be that He has put you in this place of relative protection. So that you might marshal your resources for things beyond you in a world that desperately, desperately needs your financial resources as well as your wisdom and expertise. Why do you think Bill Squire goes to hate? May he be an example to the rest of us. Because that, you see, is our calling. We never come to the point unless it is physically unless we are physically unable to do so, to say, well, that's for people who want to go do that sort of thing. You won't find that one in the baptismal covenant, my friends. We're in. We're all in. And I say that because this is, in fact, a commitment Sunday. 
not just for the people who are being confirmed and received and doing reaffirmations, but it's for all of us. You also will say, we will. It's a reminder of the covenant that all of us share if we are baptized into Christ Jesus. And who knows what kind of adventure that's going to take you. One last story and I'll close. The adventure, in fact, is not limited to your physical abilities. When I was in Philadelphia, I went to call on a woman who had just come into a nursing home. She was 98, and she had just fallen off her exercise bike and broken her hip. <laughs> Beth Sullivan. So I walk into her room, and here's Beth. She's in her bed. There's a wheelchair beside her. She has one of these tiny old 1928 prayer books beside her that have the scripture in it. And she looks at me and she's mad as a woman. And I said, well, how are you, Beth? Oh, I'm not happy at all. She always spoke to me. I like that. And I said, she said, why do you think God has me in this place? It's a horrible place. I said, well, Beth, I'm not entirely sure, but what I do know is that you're a lot sharper than a lot of the other people. You know, many of the people who live here have no way to come to see them. And see, that was true for Beth, because in her late 90s, she had actually survived all of her children. Her husband. In other words, she had a second cousin in the area, and that was about it, that would be called family. So she was one of those people. I said, Beth, maybe a part of why you're here is because you're here to get in that wheelchair and just go see her. She'd done some of that at the church. She knew what to do. And she looked at me and she wasn't particularly happy with my answer. <laughs> but it was like, okay, Father, she said. I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. So I gave her communion and prayed for her and I left. The next time I, I came to see her was several months later. I couldn't find her. <laughs> she was up an elevator with three down visiting somebody. And as soon as I began to make my way up there, she actually slipped out and gone into another room. So it was. Every time I went to visit her, until her death at 102, she was in that wheelchair going to see her. It was astonishing. God used her in a remarkable way. So please do not tell me I'm feeling too old. <laughs> You're making commitments this morning, some for the first time, others renewing. But it's a commitment to be God's hands feet and voice. And because they know, you know, that you are kept by Him, even in the midst of terribly difficult circumstances, you don't have to be you know, Winnie the Pooh's Eeyore. You instead can be one who chooses, and it is a choice, to rejoice, pray, and give thanks. Amen.